Well, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of the Wednesday Lunchtime drive Through. I'm Damon King. I'm your host for today, as I always am, a certified financial planner professional and wealth management specialist with Chapelwood Financial Services. I'm also the lead instructor for Chapelwood University, the educational branch of Chapelwood Financial. And today's topic was actually recommended by one of our guests in a previous Wednesday lunchtime drive through Jennifer, I want to give you, I don't use last names. Those of you who've been on this, you know, I don't, I don't give away your secret identities, your superhero identity, but uh, I do use first names. So Jennifer, thank you so much for recommending today's topic, non-cash charitable gifts that make an impact. She didn't come up with the name. I came up with that name, but she suggested non-cash charitable gifts as a potential idea for today. And Jennifer actually works in the nonprofit industry. And so she is very familiar with uh, gifts to charity and other ways to give. And those of you that have been in my classes before you listen to our radio show and you've met me and that sort of thing, you know that before I got into this industry, I actually spent 12 years as a fundraising professional in the nonprofit world. So I am very well versed in uh, giving to charity. How do you gift to charity? Everybody knows about cash, but today we're going to talk about some non-cash ways to do this. Now, I want to give a, a little bit of a caveat here. When I say non-cash, certainly there are gifts that you can make that are truly non-cash. There are others that eventually will be converted to cash. In fact, every gift that you give is eventually going to be converted to cash by a charity. Most charities have very little use for a house or a toy soldier collection or your comic book collection or your vintage collection of yard gnomes or whatever it is that you want to give to them, okay? They're going to convert it into cash. What I'm talking about is non-cash to you, all right? You're, it's, it's not something that you're actually writing a check, all right? So cash may not necessarily be the best way for you to give. It's the easiest, certainly, and it's the one that most people think of. But when you think about giving to charity, okay, now, most people give to charity not for the tax deduction. They give because they want to do something nice. They want to be altruistic. They want to give back to their community. But let's not kid ourselves and pretend like the tax deduction doesn't matter. The tax deduction absolutely does matter. In fact, I remember years ago when I was in the fundraising profession, I would go to conferences and they would put up a list of why do people give to charity? Why do they give to nonprofits? And way down on the list was for the tax deduction. And I always remember thinking, you know, it was like number 30 on a list of 50 things. And I always remember thinking in my mind, you know what, that sounds all well and good while the tax code allows, you know, for deductions and everything. But if anything ever happened to eliminate the tax deduction or at least eliminate the effectiveness of the tax deduction, let's see how many people are still giving to charity. Let's see how important that tax deduction really is to people. And uh, it turns out it's pretty important because when we saw the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 signed into law at the end of 2017, one of the provisions that was placed in there was that the standard deduction was doubled for pretty much every tax filing status, went from 6,000 to 12,000 for a single filer, or went from 12,000 to 24,000 for a joint tax return. As a result, fewer and fewer households now itemize their deductions. Well, charitable contributions are an itemized deduction for the most part. And not surprisingly, we have seen a reduction in charitable giving, particularly on um, you know, high net worth individuals, things like that. That doesn't mean people aren't giving to charity. People still give a lot to charity. The United States is still, there's a, there's a report called Giving USA that comes out every year. And the United States is still the most charitable country on earth. And we have a tax code that incentivizes giving. Unfortunately, it doesn't incentivize it as much. If you don't itemize your tax deductions, in, in other words, you are using the standard deduction, the ability to generate to charity is somewhat limited. So when you write a check or you give cash to a charity, you may not be able to recognize as much of a tax benefit. Your available cash is often more limited than maybe other assets that you could gift. So for some of you, 
If you had to sit down and write a $2,500 check to a charity this year, that might be a little bit of a struggle for you, or at least it would feel painful, but being able to donate $2,500 worth of stock, that might be a lot easier. I remember as a professional fundraiser, I would often encourage my larger donors and don't write me a check out of your bank account. I know that's painful. You got Christmas coming up, you wanna travel this summer, whatever. Instead, let's donate some stock because that's easy for you to do, right? And that's one of the strategies we're gonna talk about today. So gifting cash is easy. However, it might not be as beneficial to you as other types of gifts, especially when you're talking about larger amounts. Charities may not be the, or cash may not be the best way for charities to receive a contribution. All charities love cash. I've never seen a nonprofit that said, no, no, I don't want your money. No one has ever said that, right? But nonprofits know that they have to get on that treadmill every year. They have to come back and they have to call you every year, right? You wanna renew your contribution? You wanna renew your contribution? They spend thousands and thousands of dollars every year sending out direct mail appeals, things like that, hoping that you will write them a check. And so they have to ask lots and lots of people for typically smaller amounts, right? Because most people, even if they've got the money, a lot of people find it difficult to write a large check. The other thing that they have to think about is the future. It is very difficult. Think about it this way. Let's say you're a business owner and you know that you want to expand, you want to grow, you want to add more services on, you want to add more research and development, things like that, a new product line, whatever. You want to go out and hire somebody new. You create a budget every year, right? You want to be able to plan for the future. Imagine if your income stream was totally dependent upon how people felt on a given day when you called them to ask for their money, okay? You want to make sure you build in something that's a little more consistent, something a little more dependable, right? Nonprofits are the same. I always would tell people, nonprofit is not a business structure. Nonprofit is a tax status. There is no business on earth that can truly operate with no profit. That is stupid. So a lot of people think, well, it's a nonprofit. They should live off of hopes and dreams and good feelings and rainbows and puppy dog tails. No, they're businesses. They need money just like you do to operate. The only difference is they're not hoarding cash. They don't have retained earnings. They don't pay dividends to shareholders. They reinvest that money in the community. So, it's difficult for them to have to go out every year and ask for money over and over and over again. You get annoyed by it sometimes, right? So when you look at some of these gifting structures we're gonna look at today, more structured gifts over a long term actually can be more beneficial to a nonprofit than you writing your check every year because it allows them to plan for the future. If they can book a future value of some gift that you're going to give to them, which is significantly larger than any check that you could write to them, they can plan for the future and they can plan for an expansion of services. Many larger charities are moving away from this annual campaign structure where they ask you, like volunteers call up every year and ask you if you'll renew your thousand dollar pledge or whatever. And now they're, they're treating it almost like me. I have a, 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 a book of clients and it's a relationship based business. Many nonprofit fundraising professionals are treating it the exact same way. Instead of calling you up all the time, they're treating you like an investor. You're not making a gift. You are investing in the community, and I am going to provide you a return on that investment in the form of updates on how we use your money. So charities are moving towards this kind of a structure, particularly larger ones. All right. So let's finally dive into this. The first non-cash way that you can donate to a charitable organization, you can volunteer. There are more ways to give than just gifts of assets, monetary value, and volunteerism is one of the best ways to do that. A gift of time can sometimes be more valuable than a gift of money. I volunteer for junior achievement, and I love uh, going into the classroom and teaching personal financial literacy to students. Now, I write a check to Junior Achievement every year, but I get far more 
back in return from going and volunteering my time than I do from writing the check because I get to see the difference that I'm making right there in the faces of those children. And in some cases, teenagers, all right? And it's actually in some ways more valuable to junior achievement that I as a financial professional can come out and give really good real world advice and experience, whether it's on career or how to prepare for their future and save money, then if I wrote a check and then they had to go hire some high priced keynote speaker to come in and talk about it. You see what I'm saying? So there are ways that volunteerism can sometimes even be better than a check. One thing you have to know, and I got, all, I got this question asked all the time, particularly from professionals who donated their time, the IRS does not allow you to deduct the value of your time. So if you're a professional and you spend your time in service to a nonprofit, you are not allowed to deduct your time. What you can deduct is the value of any expenses that you incur in service to the nonprofit. Perfect example I always give. Let's say a carpenter donates his or her time in building a new bookshelf for a library. The carpenter cannot deduct the value of his or her time that was spent in building the bookshelf, but he or she can deduct the value of the wood and the materials that went in to building the bookshelf, okay? Does that make sense? So you can't deduct the value of time donated, but you can deduct the value of expenses incurred as part of the donation. So gas traveling to and from a volunteer site, uh, you know, meals that you pay for yourself and you're not reimbursed uh, on behalf of, or by the, the nonprofit, things like that. An in-kind donation, uh, you know what, I, that's the wrong, see, this you get the benefit of live television here, ladies and gentlemen. I should not have put that uh, little, that's on the next one. See how it didn't change right there? The point is, is that volunteerism is a big, big thing. And I encourage you to get out and volunteer in your community. Volunteerism is actually a great thing to do when you're retired. In fact, our radio show this weekend is going to be all about eight things that you should ask yourself before you retire, because a lot of people find that they might have the monetary side of things in place, but they don't have anything in place on how they're going to spend their time in retirement. And they think, I'm going to travel. I'm going to sleep in. That stuff only lasts so long. Make sure you've got a way to spend your time. The next non-cash way to donate, an in-kind donation. Typically, this is a tangible item like clothing or appliances or books or equipment, you know, just something. Think about when you, when you load up your car with stuff and you drive down to Goodwill and you donate your gently used items, right? Um, that's an in-kind donation. You're not writing a check. You are giving an in-kind donation. And many charities, if you ask, they will have a wish list of things that they're looking for, new computers. You know, I, some of our larger companies here in town, they had a policy that every few years they would change out their computers. And every year I'd get an email from OG&E or from Chesapeake Energy or from one of the other big companies that said, hey, we're donating some of our gently used computer equipment. Are there any nonprofits that need this equipment? And you would apply and that, that's one way they could do that. So. Um, sometimes those items can help to further the mission as well. You set the tax deductible value for the item that you're donating. The charity is not responsible for valuing that for you. In fact, most will not. What they will do is simply give you a letter acknowledging that you donated this item and with a stipulation down at the bottom that the tax deductible value of the item is to be determined by the donor. So the nonprofit is not in the business of giving you a tax deduction. You set that yourself. And of course, you are expected to value it correctly, uh, value it fairly, all right? But in-kind donations can relieve a charity of having to go and purchase that item themselves. You know, if you wanna donate computer equipment and you have a large business or a large office, if it's really good shape and it's got software and stuff on it, that's, uh, that happened all the time in nonprofits I worked for, and we didn't have to go out and buy the equipment. Uh, let's see, we've got a comment here. Uh, that, uh, Jennifer says, that's an important piece that many donors are unaware of. And so Jennifer, I, I imagine what you're talking about is they're the ones that are responsible for setting the tax deductible value. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, okay. So yes, 
A lot of people assume that the charity determines that. No, you determine that. It's not the charity's job to do that, all right? Their job is to accept your donation and put it to work fulfilling their mission. All right, now let's get into some really good stuff here. Appreciated stock. Appreciated stock is one of my favorite ways to give. And it was one of the ways that I encouraged, as I mentioned, donors to give all the time. Because again, it might be tough for you to write a $5,000 check, but you might have a stock account or an account with appreciated stock in it that if you were to sell it, you would have a significant capital gain that you would have to pay taxes on, right? But instead, you can donate appreciated stock directly to a charity. And this does two things for you from a tax standpoint. Number one, you get a tax deduction for the fair market value of the shares of stock that you donate. Of course, you only really get to recognize that deduction if you itemize your deductions. But the other tax benefit, it's a double tax benefit, if you went out and just sold that stock, and again, we're talking about in an after-tax account, all right? So if you're gonna donate stock, it needs to be from an after-tax account. If you donate stock from a tax-deferred account like an IRA, well, then you lose the benefit here because number one, well, because it's after it's a tax deferred. And if you take money out of a tax deferred account, what happens? It's a taxable distribution to you. So this needs to be appreciated stock inside of an after tax account, like a brokerage account or a transfer on death account or a joint investment account. So you get a tax deduction for the fair market value, but you also receive a deduction or you, you get to avoid the capital gains tax on the gain because you are not liquidating the asset yourself. You are sending it directly to the charity. So you wanna make sure that you gift the stock directly to the charity. Do not sell it, then send cash because you've negated the purpose of donating the, charity, the, cat, the stock, right? So you have to understand though that not all charities are set up to accept gifts of stock. Many are nowadays, especially the larger ones. In fact, they have instructions. So my advice to you is if you would like to donate stock, appreciated stock to a nonprofit organization, I would call them, ask them number one, do you accept gifts of appreciated stock? And number two, if they say yes, ask them, would you please send me your transfer instructions? Because they likely already have some kind of an investment account set up with a large investment firm, and they're going to have instructions of transfer it to this account and do it this way and that sort of thing. So make sure that the charity you want to donate stock to can even accept a gift of stock. Most charities have what's called a gift acceptance policy, and that will dictate the kinds of gifts that they can receive outside of just straight up cash. It may be that they can't accept a gift of stock, but I love this idea because most people can gift far more in stock than a check that they could write out of their bank account. And you get the double tax benefit uh, when you do this. All right, Oops. required minimum distributions. All right, so here's another one of my favorite ones. All right, so if you have a tax deferred account and prior to 2020, you had turned 70 and a half years old, you have to start taking required minimum distributions from your tax deferred accounts, all right? It's a minimum amount that you have to take by December 31st of the calendar year. And of course, those distributions to you are taxable. For 2020 and after, um, the age has changed to 72, all right? Uh, wait, is that right? Yeah, 2020 or is it 20? No, 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 sorry, yes. Yes, because it was a part of the SECURE Act. That's what it was. I, see, there's all these laws that have changed. So if you have not yet turned 70 and a half by 2020 or later, your age is 72, all right? The point is, is that let's say you don't need that income, but you have to take it. Because if you don't, if you do not take your required minimum distributions when you're supposed to, not only will you pay income tax on the money you were supposed to pay, but you will pay a 50% penalty surcharge on that RMD. I have many clients that have sufficient income coming from other places, social security, pensions, mineral royalties, real estate, whatever, business. They don't need their RMDs. So what do they do? Instead of taking that RMD and then having it to be taxable to you, 
you can donate up to $100,000 in required minimum distributions to a qualified charitable organization. It counts as your RMD for the year, but it will not count as taxable income to you. And that is the real superpower right there. And this is important, okay? If you have substantial income in retirement and you're on Medicare, if you've been in my class before, you've been on this drive-through before, you know that your Medicare premiums can go up as you have more taxable income. Well, if you take a required minimum distribution, that is going to increase your taxable income and therefore could increase your Medicare Part B and D premiums. So not only can you decrease your taxable income and thereby your taxes by donating your required minimum distribution to a charity, you can also try to stay under those thresholds for the income related monthly adjustment amount on your Medicare premiums. I'm just coming at you with all kinds of knowledge today, aren't I? Now, here's the key. The RMD must be sent from your investment account, your, your retirement account custodian like Fidelity or TD Ameritrade or Asset Mark. It must go from the custodian directly to the qualified charity. The check should be made out directly to the charity, not to you. You don't want to touch the money because if you do, you could be considered in constructive receipt of that money and it could be deemed as a taxable distribution to you. So make sure that your custodian understands. In fact, this has a name. It's called a Qualified Charitable Distribution or a QCD. That's what this is. It's a phenomenal way to give to charity, lower your tax bill, decrease the likelihood that your Medicare premiums are going to go up. All right, so great thing to think about. All right, we've got uh, another chat here. Uh, Jennifer also says, to remember as it relates to a qualified charitable distribution of a, a required minimum distribution, remember to include the name of the donor on the check or the stock gift. Otherwise the charity won't know where to credit the gift. So that's very important because what the charity is going to do is they want to send you a thank you letter. And if you don't put your name on the check or have your custodian put your name on the check or the gift of stock, they'll never know who donated it. Of course, if you want to remain anonymous, that's your choice. But uh, if you don't, make sure you put your name on that. Good point. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, what about a gift of real estate? It is possible to give a gift of real estate. Now you can just donate a house or a building or whatever, uh, but there is something called, what, that's called a retained life estate. A retained life estate allows you to donate a piece of real estate to a charity. You receive a deduction for the present value of the expected remainder to the charity. The expected remainder is, whatever they can sell it for when you pass away, because that's what they're going to do when you pass away. Because what you're doing is you're transferring the actual title to the charity. The charity now owns the piece of property. You don't own it anymore. This has the effect of reducing your taxable estate. If you've got a larger estate right now, the, the estate tax, the gift and estate tax exclusion amount is over $11 million but it's gonna go back to about 5 million starting in tax year 2025. If you've got quite a bit of assets, there's a chance, particularly if you're a, a unmarried and you don't have another person to combine your exclusion amount with, there's a chance that you could eclipse the estate tax thresholds. By using a life estate or a retained life estate, you can remove that asset from your taxable estate. You get a tax deduction for the future value of that but the real benefit here is that, let's say it's your primary home that you wanna donate. You can continue to live in the home, even though the nonprofit owns it. And of course you wanna have this stipulated through a contract or through a written agreement, but you can continue to live in or use the property, even if it's like business property, it doesn't have to be a home, for a period of time or for the rest of your life. The charity owns the property and they're likely gonna sell it and liquidated for cash at your passing. If there are any required qualified appraisals necessary as a part of this gift, you are required to pay for those appraisals. The nonprofit is not allowed to pay, the, pay for those for you, all right? And you cannot deduct the value of the appraisal from the value of the gift. Now, the expense may be tax deductible, but you can't withhold that amount from the total value of the donation, okay? 
So it is possible to donate your home to a charity and still live in it for the rest of your life. And you know, let's say your home is worth $250,000. You may never in your life be able to write a $250,000 check, but you can give an asset valued at $250,000 and the charity can then use that to further their mission. How about a charitable gift annuity? Now this is one that, uh, did I skip one? No, I did not, all right. So let's say that you are concerned about income and retirement. Most everybody is. That's the number one fear of retirees is running out of money. And really what we're afraid of is not having enough income. So let's say that, you know, I'd like to donate a piece of property to a charity, but I'd really like a stream of income. Well, a charitable gift annuity is a really great way to give to charity, but also create a stream of lifetime income for yourself. So a CGA or a charitable gift annuity is a contract with a charity that allows you to donate a piece of property in exchange for lifetime income. Now this piece of property could be almost anything. Generally it's a piece of uh, real estate. Uh, it could be an interest in a business, um, anything that has some kind of monetary value. Now, in exchange for donating this piece of property to the charity, the charity is now the owner of it, the charity agrees to pay you a lifetime income for the rest of your life. It could be on two lives, all right? But you receive a tax deduction for the value of the donated item. And at your passing, the charity will then sell the item, the asset that you donated, more than likely, and then they will keep the remainder, all right? So they're paying you income through your life and then Ideally, there is some remaining value on the asset that they can sell and recover what they've paid you plus a little extra. Now, most charities have a policy that places age restrictions on who they will or will not enter into a charitable gift annuity with. And generally for the charity, the older you are, the better. Think about it this way. The charity knows they're going to have to pay out income to you for the rest of your life. What's more advantageous for them? If you're 60 years old and they may have to pay you for 30 years, or if you're 85 years old and they may only have to pay you for five years, okay? So when you think about it from that standpoint, the charity does not wanna lock in a contract where they're gonna to have to be on the hook to pay you for 25 plus years. When I was in the business, most charities had a policy that says we will not write a charitable gift annuity for anybody under the age of 65. Sometimes it was 70. Now that we're living longer, those ages have probably gone up. But if you wanna do a charitable gift annuity, be sure to ask the charity, do you even do this, all right? But it can be a great, great hedge against uh, the loss of income, or you wanna create a guaranteed stream of income for yourself in retirement. And then finally is that, yeah, finally we've got insurance, all right? So you can purchase uh, a life insurance or annuity policy, and you can name the charity as the beneficiary on that policy. You can even fund a, an irrevocable trust like an irrevocable life insurance trust or an islet with insurance. And then when you pass away, that insurance policy goes into the trust, the death benefit goes to the trust and then the charitable organization is the beneficiary of the trust. But if you really just wanna keep it simple, just buy a life insurance policy or an annuity and then you name the beneficiary, the, the uh, charity, as the beneficiary, it goes straight to them, all right? You will receive a tax deduction for the value of the premiums that you pay on that insurance policy. And the great thing about life insurance is that a relatively small amount of cash can buy quite a bit of life insurance. I mean, if you buy a million dollar term life policy, I mean, you can buy a lot of term life, term life insurance for a small amount of money, all right? So you can leverage a lot of insurance and future value to the charity for a little bit of money up front. And uh, it makes large gifts to charity more affordable. We have many clients do this for their family. You know, they don't have a million dollars to leave to their family, plus they wanna use the money they've saved to live on. What do they do? They go out and buy a life insurance policy of a million dollars the kids will get the life insurance policy, tax-free, by the way. Meanwhile, they can still live on the money that they've saved for retirement. You can do the same thing uh, with insurance to a charity. 
couple of final notes here. Think before you give, okay? So for you, on your side, for your benefit, have you done your homework on the charity that you want to give to, all right? There are many resources out there that can help you to determine the viability of a nonprofit organization. Uh, there's guidestar.org. You can go on and, and pull information about a charity. There's Charity Navigator that you can go out uh, and do. But you want to make sure that the nonprofit you're going to give to is financially viable, that they're going to be around, that they're doing what they say they're going to do. Have you engaged the financial professionals that you're going to need to help you with more complex gifts, like uh, a life estate that we talked about, or to donate stock, or some kind of a complex charitable trust arrangement, something like that? And have you shared your plans with your family? You know, the worst thing is to say, tell the charity, oh yeah, yeah, when I die, you're gonna get a million dollars. Does your family know that? Because if they don't, chances are, they're not gonna be as charitably minded as you. You may care about that charity over there, but they may not. So you wanna make sure these things are in writing and you wanna make sure that they're communicated. I also want you to think about it this way. We continue to use the word gift and give. I want you to shift your thinking. Instead of thinking of I'm making a gift, think I'm making an investment in my community. When you make a gift to somebody, there's no expectation of anything in return, right? And you don't expect the nonprofit to give you money back, but you do expect them to give you something back, some return, and that return is a report on how did you use my donation? How did you use my investment? How many people did you help? How many lives did you change? That's your ROI when you invest in a nonprofit organization. Now on the flip side, from the standpoint of the charity, think about before you just give some piece of junk to them, is this asset valuable enough for the charity to even reap a benefit, okay? They're not gonna be able to use some worthless piece of land out that has a bunch of toxic sludge on it, okay? A bunch of nuclear waste buried underneath it. And furthermore, they're probably not gonna accept that donation anyway. But can they even sell it? Because remember, they don't want your property, they want the cash that comes from that property. Is there a ready market to be able to sell that piece of property so the charity can use the resulting cash to further their mission. Is the charity gonna to have to jump through a lot of legal and financial hoops to make this happen? Because remember, the people who work at charities, they're smart people, they're hardworking, they're not financial professionals usually, all right? They don't know how a lot of this complex stuff works any more than you do, generally speaking. They're relying on financial professionals like me to help guide them. They don't have time to go out and do all this work for you. They're out there trying to raise millions of dollars for their mission. So if you make it too difficult for them, they're probably not gonna to wanna to do it. And you know what? People and charities hate having to tell you no because they wanna say yes to you. They, they wanna accept your gift. They want you to feel good about it. Don't put them in the position of having to say no to a gift that just has too many legal or financial hoops or, or caveats attached to it. And remember, nonprofits are actually businesses, all right? They're not filled with people who are working for nothing for a living. They don't pay taxes, but there are many other expenses. They don't want your old junk any more than you do. It drives me crazy when I go, I donate things to Goodwill, just like you do, and I walk in and I see somebody's pile of crap sitting on the floor, and I'm like, really? Really? I mean, come on. So think about it. And if you, if you just are unsure, call the nonprofit to ask, will you accept this? Is this something that you can use to further your mission? Do you have the capacity to accept this donation? All right. So just a few things. And uh, some of that is from my own experiences in that industry. All right. So uh, are there any thoughts or questions? Uh, we're running a little bit over time here. So if I may have your permission to go for just a little bit more, if you've got to log off, I understand. Uh, but are there any thoughts or questions? Uh, are you, have you set up uh, a unique gifting strategy uh, to a nonprofit in your estate or something else? Uh, do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask me about anything that you're considering? I'd be happy to uh, either share them here or we can talk offline at some point. Uh, so be thinking of your questions or your thoughts, share them in the Q&A, share them in the chat box. While you're thinking of that, of course, I always have to tell you about our next class, Rocky Retirement. It's coming up April 22nd and 29th, so just next week, 
is uh, the first night, night number one of our April session. And we're gonna share with you how to build an income plan so you don't run out of money. We're gonna share you how to make the best social security decision you can. I'm gonna share with you what you need to know about Medicare. I'm gonna share with you five strategies for lowering your tax bill. I'm also gonna share with you one of the only ways that I know of, that we know of, to avoid having to pay any tax at all on your social security distribution. We talk about that in our second night in tax planning. We discuss with you what's the difference between a will and a trust, and how do you know which one might be better for you. So we cover all of that. My clients who are on the call, you always get to come for free. You never have to pay. So just let me know if you ever want to come to a class. If you're not a member of the Chapelwood family right now, for you, it's just $49, and that's for you and a guest. It's all online right here from the comfort of your own home, and you get to uh, enjoy and ask any question you want. We'll send you the workbook. Go to chapelwoodu.com, that's chapelwooduniversity.com to enroll in that class. Doesn't look like we have any other questions or comments for today. So as always, I wanna thank you so much for being on the Wednesday lunchtime drive through Appreciate you taking the time as you always do every week. I hope you enjoyed today's topic. Thank you again to Jennifer for suggesting it. And I will say to anybody else, if you ever have any other topic that you would like me to discuss in a future Wednesday lunchtime drive through drop me a line. Uh, email me at damon at chapelwood.com. Call us at 405-348-0909. Uh, and just let us know, hey, Damon, I think you should talk about this. And chances are, I'll put it on there. So thank you so much. Hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your week. Have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you next week on the Wednesday Lunchtime Drive-Thru. Take care. Bye-bye.